Welcome to another episode of Costume Cinematographico. In the second episode on my series of the Costumes of Westeros, I continue my exploration of the continent of Westeros from the world of Game of Thrones from the HBO series by the same name. And if you haven't seen episode one where I explore the North, I will leave a link in the description below. And as always, a warning for spoilers for the entire six seasons of Game of Thrones. The Night's Watch is a military order which holds and guards the wall, the immense ice structure which separates the northern border of the Seven Kingdoms from the lands beyond. Here is an early concept sketch by Michelle Clapton of a Night's Watch brother's clothing. The notes are so blurry though, so I'm not sure who this costume was intended for. Kit Harrington says of his sworn brotherhood look, my costumes don't really change that much because essentially, the Night's Watch wear what they arrive in, but anything they arrive in is dyed black. My costumes, they're brilliantly made and brilliantly designed, and especially the cloaks make you feel very weighty and powerful. Michelle Clapton of the Costume Design says, The Night's Watch when we join it is in decline and has been for some time. Everything that they wear there could be mostly padding. Fur, not really metal armor, because you can't with it. It's in cold, it's impractical, but it's not a uniform because they're not funded enough to do that anymore. But as long as it's black, it's enough for them to wear. They sort of live, eat, sleep in the same costume, so it just has to almost smell. Pip always looks cold, Michelle Clapton says. He's got really thin clothing. He wasn't planning on coming to the wall. Clapton goes on to say that wealthy people will bring clothes with them that are probably more suitable. The others actually often arrive in a thin jacket. That's all they have. Sam, for instance, coming from a noble background, has a much higher standard of clothing. And I read in an interview uh, recently that in season one, Michelle Clapton used IKEA rugs for a lot of the woolly collars for the Night's Watch, like the one seen here on Sam. Clapton says that Jon Snow is planning, is really excited about it. You know, there's almost because he has an understanding of where he's going. She also says, We also decided we keep the recruits in their own clothing, aside from crude standard issuing sparring armor. They don't don their black garb until they've passed the muster and taken their Night's Watch vows. Many of the new recruits are plucked from prisons, so they don't have a cape or even a cloak. So within the recruits, there's a mixture of colors and fabrics depending on where they came from. And while it seems ridiculous that the main cast members never wear hats, Michelle Clapton tells Fashionista in an interview, I wish they did wear more hats, but unfortunately in filming every time I put a hat on, they say, but we can't see who the actor is. Beyond the Wall is a geographic region that is largely uncharted and the only part of Westeros that is not ruled by the Iron Throne. The True North is inhabited by wildlings or free folk, a group of semi-nomadic hunters. Of the free folk costumes, Clapton says, we made all the costumes from the North from skins. For research, we looked at the Inuits and at Tibetan tribes. We try and look at peoples in different times in history to see how they would have dressed in that environment. And I have two examples here. They're both from the McCord Museum in Montreal, Canada. On the left is an example of an Inuit seal parka from 1910 to 1915, and that's from the Western Arctic region. And on the right is an Inuit caribou fur parka from between 1900 and 1918 from the Central Arctic part of uh, Canada. And here's a contemporary parka from 1988 made from caribou fur, and that's also on display at the McCord Museum. The image on the left is a Nenet Siberian nomad, and on the right is a more contemporary image of Tibetan nomads. And as you'll notice by the one on the left, it's very similar to the Inuit in uh, North America. And finally, here are a few pictures of the Sami people. They're a group of indigenous people living north of the Arctic Circle in Sapmi, or Lapland as, as it's known in English. The garment worn by the man on the right really looks a lot like the costumes of the free folk north of the wall. 
Clapton's team made skirts for the women out of waxed skins. Not so much for fashion, she says, but to help differentiate the female wildlings from the men. Egret's boots have antlers on the soles as makeshift crampons, which are a traction device used for walking on snow and ice. Clapton also says, I also looked at Lascelles cave paintings in France. They have these wonderful animal paintings. We decided that every time they killed an animal, the hunters would have to paint an animal onto their costumes. The better the hunter, the more covered in these drawings he would be, which I think visually is really strong. We're always looking for ways to show who the leader is. Michelle Clapton says, I don't sometimes look at costumes for research. I just look at what they could have, what they could find there. How would they build a costume? What are the environments? It's a sense of reality. I just look at techniques and how people exist in similar climates. Wildlings who dwell near the coast, like Carsey, wear seashells on their clothing. Here is her costume on display where you can see the rows of muscle shells. Rattle shirt or the Lord of Bones wears a fabricated giant skull helmet and armor from human bones. Here is a promotional shot of Rattleshirt and his warband in their wildling costumes. For Rattleshirt's bone armor, Clapton's team made molds of human and animal bones and strapped them together with latex designed to resemble sinew. Clapton says, we have weavers, embroiderers, and printers, so a lot of costumes are created from scratch. Craster's wives' costumes, for instance, were woven from raffia, rabbit skin, and feathers, which were then aged in our breakdown rooms. In season six, Bran and Mira dress in wildling-style clothing to protect themselves against the harshness of the weather north of the wall. Finally, as seen in this promo from Season 7 with Tormond, it appears that John will be north of the wall, indicated by his wildling-style clothing. The Riverlands is one of the regions of the Seven Kingdoms that include the noble houses, Tully, Frey, and Arryn. House Frey is the current ruler of the Riverlands from the capital of River Run. The Vale of Arryn is protected, surrounded, and isolated from the rest of Westeros by a significant mountain range and is accessible only during warmer seasons. The Vale is ruled by House Arryn of the Eyrie, one of the great houses of Westeros. Lady Lysa Arryn was the Lady Regent of the Vale, ruling on behalf of her young son Robin Arryn before she was pushed through the moon door by Peter Baelish. Both Lysa and Robin wear the winged capes of the Vale in resemblance to the falcon of their family sigil. The structure of the cape consists of a yoke collar with voluminous amounts of cartridge pleating gathered at the shoulders with another generous amount of draped fabric tacked at the bottom of the front and the back yoke. Lysa's undergown uh, also has slash sleeves, leaving her arms bare while Robin's are closed. And the other noble people of the Vale, both men and women, wear similar falcon-like cloaks. Lady Anya Wainwood of House Wainwood is seen here with Peter Baelish and Jan Royce, head of House Royce. Both are vassal houses to House Aaron of the Eyrie. Royce's armor is similar to the Knights of the Vale. Lady Wainwood's costume is similar to the other Vale costumes. The palette of the Vale costumes are soft gray, green and gold, and the costume worn here by Lysa is a throwback to her time in the capital city of King's Landing, where she resided with her husband John before his murder. This robe has a Lannister Japanese look to it. Both Lysa and Robin wear outfits from velvet brocade woven with the metallic falcon motif. Although Michelle Clapton hasn't spoken of the eerie costumes in interviews, it's likely that these fabrics were custom made to her specifications. Lysa's dress is anchored at the center front with a pewter colored falcon. Here's a close-up shot of the falcon and the amazing embroidery by the talented Michelle Carragher. Here's a great close-up of the raised stumpwork embroidery of the falcon. Robin has a smaller version of the falcon. And here's a great shot of the back of the cloak. We see that it's actually laced like a corset. And Robin wears another falcon brocade cloak in taupe and metallic gold. 
As Lord Robin ages and without the influence of his mother, his clothing begins to change. Here he wears a beautiful pipe organ pleated gambeson with detachable sleeves. And this beautiful velvet brocade overcoat seen here incorporates the falcon as well. Sir Vardis Egan was the captain of the guards at the Erie before his death at the hands of Braun, who was Tyrion's champion in the first trial by combat. Egan's heavy plated armor that included a metal studded cuirass and fods, which are the leg protectors, and closed helm ultimately cost him his life. Braun quickly tired out Egan wearing some lightweight leather armor instead. The Vale Knights wear partial plate armor, including the cuirass and pauldrons, both worn over a hauberk and gambeson. Their helmets are open faced bassinets, similar to the ones worn by the Stark army. Here is a reproduction of an Italian bassinet, similar to the Vale Knights. River Run, a large castle in the Riverlands, is the ancestral home of House Tully, who have recently been outseated by their enemy House Frey. And following the death of his father, Lord Hoster Tully, Edmure Tully, Caitlin's younger brother, becomes the new Lord of House Tully until they are betrayed by the Freys at the Red Wedding. The Tully armor is very distinguishable from the armors of the other six kingdoms because it is covered with scales. Their family sigil is a trout, which in my opinion is sort of unfortunate, uh, but if you ask me, but their house makes the most of it. Michelle Clapton says of this, each place we go, we try to create a different look that we identify with that family. So because of the fish sigil, we decided to do leather scales. We wanted some browns and greens and we textured them so it's mostly leather armor. Here's actually a sample of scale-like armor that I found. It belongs to the Tinglet Warriors, uh, which were a people of the West Coast, uh, indigenous people that resided in Northern BC and Alaska. And this armor is made from walrus, walrus leather and it's covered with Chinese coins, uh, an item that they obtained through trade. The Tully soldiers wear their armor over a layer of cloth, gambesons, and hauberks, which is a shirt of mail. And many of the soldiers also wear chainmail coifs, which is a protection for the head, neck, and shoulders. Here is a German steel and brass mail shirt on the left from the 15th century on display at the Met in New York City. And it's also commonly called the hauberk. And on the right is a collar of mail that's also from the 16th century that is German and it's made from steel, copper alloy and iron. Brynden the Blackfish Tully is Caitlin Stark's uncle. Michelle Clapton says this of his costume. The Blackfish is one of those characters that lives, sleeps, does everything in the same costume. You really believe he doesn't take it off. He swaggers in and clumps down. You feel a real sense of security with him. Edmer is more fancy pants. And if you look at this outfit, you'll see that the entire thing is in no nonsense black. There's not a bit of metallic in the costume, not even in the sigil, which is, if you look closely, is an embossed, embossed trout. Edmer's sigil, meanwhile, has touches of gold, and instead of a collar, his armor has leather shoulder pieces. And instead of wearing a male hauberk, his shirt is actually made from grommeted leather. In this scene, Edmer is here dressed in finery for his wedding, and you'll notice that his sash is clasped together with two tellyfish. Liza Aaron is Caitlin Stark's younger sister, and I don't really have much to add to her because uh, she's pretty much divested herself of any traditional telly clothing. Meanwhile, Caitlin Stark, she wears a hybrid of both the Stark and telly fashions. So Michelle Clapton says of that, Caitlin, again, similar sort of tones and very underplayed, quite simple clothing. Caitlin doesn't think particularly of what she wears. She wears what she's always worn. It's a traditional way and that's her look. Here are some close-up looks at her costumes from a photo shoot. The fabrics, they're not particularly decadent as the capitals are. The fabrics appear to be linen. And while the padded collars are uniquely Northern, 
Caitlin incorporates her family sigil of the trout both in the embroidery of the padded collars and in the little penannular brooch that holds her gown together at the front. Here's a picture of some of the women from House Tully dressed in very simple gowns that are closed at the front again with the trout brooch. And here's a great close-up uh, that I took from Michelle Carriger's website of the lovely embroidery uh, that she's done on Caitlin's collar. Meanwhile, Caitlin's cloak is woolen with the cross straps appearing to be boiled wool. And on her gown, which I've uh, indicated here, you can see the two hand-sewn grommet holes. But for some reason, the costume curator attached her fish brooch to the ties instead of the gown. On the right, it's more embroidery from Michelle Carriger, and it looks like some type of leaves, but I'm not quite sure what they are. So if you think you know what it is, uh, please leave a comment in the section below. I'd appreciate it. The Twins, sometimes known as The Crossing, is a castle and the seat of House Frey, the great house of the Riverlands and former vassal family to House Tully. Lord Walder Frey was the head of House Frey, and he's seen here in the episode Baylor with his, this is kind of gross, his eighth wife, which is 15-year-old Joyous Ehrenford. And like many of the Frey men and women, Joyous wears a medieval coif made from cloth. And the style of her dress is referred to as a coat hardy, which is a medieval garment worn by both men and women during the Middle, e Middle Ages. And Walder has a basic look, so it includes a doublet, a leather jerkin, and a warm velvet medieval coat, uh, which is a floor-length sleeveless robe. In this scene during the Red Wedding, Walder wears a quilted and studded jerkin, which actually might be a brigandine, which is a style of jerkin that's reinforced with metal plates. And I suppose he would wear something like that as extra protection for what would come after that. In this shot, you can see that while Walder's costumes are broken down, they are actually very beautifully made. All of Walder Frey's daughters wear variations on the coat hardy in an assortment of unflattering bottle green colors. And most of the women also wear a T-shaped leather belt, the same one that we see on Walda Bolton in uh, the previous episode I did. Walder Frey's daughter, Rosalind Frey, wears a much more flattering wedding gown. Her bodice is in a green gold brocade. Here is Lother Frey, one of Walder Frey's many sons, wearing a leather coif and Black Walder, or Walder Rivers, as he's also called, the bastard son of Walder Frey. Black Walder wears a punched leather armor piece over his gambeson and a cape consisting of a leather yoke from which hangs cartridge pleated rough cloth. And he also wears a cloth coif and a leather arming cap. The Frey soldiers seen here wear multiple layers, cloth gambesons and skirts, short sleeve leather doublets, with stiffened leather armor breastplates of sorts and leather arming caps. Some of the men even wear a cervelliere, which is a hemispherical close-fitting skull cap made from steel or iron, and it was worn as a helmet during the medieval period. Here is a cervelier from the 13th century. The cervelier is the precursor to the bassinet, which is elongated to cover the neck, and the bassinet is the helmet of choice by the Stark soldiers. In the Frey costumes, they kind of remind me of this scene from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. The actors seen here wear a variety of leather and woven coifs. And I hope you enjoyed part two in my series about the costumes of Westeros. So be sure to check out part three. And if you enjoy learning more about the costumes of Game of Thrones and the work by the talented Michelle Clapton, make sure to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss anything. And if you enjoy this video, please like and share it with your friends. And as always, thank you so much for watching.